Today, what I want to do is show you how to get on top of your financial house. I want you to be standing there, but it's going to take a few years. It's not going to be quick. If you're looking for a get-rich-quick scheme, you're in the wrong room. Now how do you get on top of your financial house? In Tennessee, if we want to get up on top of a house, we use a ladder, and ladders have steps. There are rules about using these steps. If you climb up and the ladder starts to move, if you're over 16 that is, you come back down, steady the ladder, and try again. You repeat the steps, but you take them slow and gradual. You don't skip steps because that's how you end up hanging upside down with a broken leg, making your neighbor laugh. No skipping steps. Be willing to come back down to solid ground and repeat the process. These are the rules for using a ladder. Around our place, we call these steps baby steps. And you don't move to baby step 4 until you've completed baby step 1. There's a process here, and there's a reason for it. You have to lay a solid foundation. When building a house, you don't start with the crown molding before you've even put up the drywall or built the structure on a solid foundation. We start with baby step 1. Before doing anything else, set up a $1,000 starter emergency fund. Get this $1,000 as fast as you can. That's not your full emergency fund. That's your starter. I want you to gather 10 Benjamin Franklins, quickly, right now, fast. This is the easiest baby step because it's only $1,000, and it's the one you'll complete the fastest. In many cases though, this is the hardest step, because this is the point where you decide whether you're really going to change your life. Are you really going to buy into this process? Are you really going to do what others have successfully done? Are you truly ready to engage in this process, or will you continue doing things haphazardly as you've been doing? It's time to get serious. Get focused. This thing is going to change because here's the problem. We humans don't like change. We tend to do the same thing over and over again. Some of us work in jobs we've hated every day for 15 years, and the only reason we don't change is that we don't like change. Even if what we're doing isn't working, we defend it. We fight for our right to be foolish. We get stuck in our ways, like a toddler in a dirty diaper. We know it smells bad, but it's warm, and it's ours. If you want to succeed in life, you have to learn to embrace change because the only constant in life is change itself. Embrace it, especially when it comes to managing your money. You start with $1,000 in the bank, and then you learn to save money, something nobody really does. Everyone talks about it, everyone agrees it's wise, but nobody does it. You're walking around in the richest country the world has ever known, and yet all the money leaves your house every month. You have to make saving money a philosophical, theological, spiritual, emotional, relational, and mathematical process. I'm sick of being broke. After 20 years of doing budgets, I do know something about it. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. But so is being broke. What we're starting here is the first step of savings, the emergency fund. Grandma always said to save for a rainy day. According to Money Magazine, 78% of Americans will face a major negative financial event in any given 10-year period. You better be ready because it's coming. You need to save money for emergencies because you're an emergency looking for a place to happen. If you haven't faced a financial setback of $5,000 to $7,000 in the last few years, statistically, you're overdue. It's coming. Get ready. You need to build your emergency fund. You need to be positive. I'm positive it's going to rain. Get yourself an emergency fund. That's how this stuff works. You don't even have to put it in the bank. One lady framed her $1,000 and put it in an 8x10 picture frame from Walmart. She named it and wrote, In case of emergency, break glass underneath. Just make sure it's not too easy to access, but accessible if needed. Get that minimum starter emergency fund ready to go. Personal finances are 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. You've got to change what you're doing to get a different result. You can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome. The 12 steppers call that the definition of insanity. Baby step 2. The debt snowball. Pay off all your debt except your home using the debt snowball method. List your debt smallest to largest. Pay minimum payments on everything but the smallest one and attack it with a vengeance. Once it's paid off, take that payment and any extra money you can squeeze out of your budget and attack the next one. Keep rolling over the snowball, picking up more snow each time until you reach your largest debt, except your home. Typically, this is a student loan or a car payment. When you're paying $1,500 to $2,000 a month on a $10,000 debt, it disappears quickly. 
Yes, it would be mathematically proper to pay off the highest interest rate debt first. But this is about behavior modification, not math. When you go on a diet, losing weight in the first week keeps you motivated to continue. You want to see results for your effort? Knocking off debts one by one builds belief, faith, and intensity. You have to get to a point where you say, I've had it, I'm sick of this. That's when you change your life. You can't wander into debt, but you can't wander out. You need that moment where you say, that's it, I'm tired of working my butt off and having nothing to show for it but an empty payment book. But I promise you it works. If you keep doing it, you'll get to chase the cheetah. Now you won't have any payments but a house payment. We're now at baby step two. We've reached the 18 to 24 month mark, which feels pretty good. Our next goal is to continue with gazelle intensity and focus on building up that $1,000 account until it reaches a fully funded emergency fund, which is three to six months of expenses. Emergency funds should be easy to access or liquid. Put them in a money market type account with your mutual fund company and have check writing privileges. It's not going to earn much interest, but that's not the point. I want you to put three to six months of expenses in there. For some of you, that may be $10,000, $15,000, or even $20,000 just sitting there, boring but ready for life to happen. Here's the deal. Your emergency fund is not an investment, it's insurance. Investments make you money, but insurance costs you money to protect your money. You buy insurance to protect your house, your health, or to replace your income if something happens to you. Your emergency fund is there to protect your investments. If you dip into your 401k because you don't have an emergency fund, you'll end up losing half of it in penalties and taxes. That's why it's essential to have an emergency fund. I've been there. I didn't have an emergency fund when I was a millionaire doing real estate. Everything went back into the deals, and we had no liquidity. That lack of wiggle room is one reason I face challenges. An emergency fund puts a buffer between you and Murphy's Law. If something can go wrong, it will. Without an emergency fund, Murphy will move in with his three cousins, broke, desperate, and stupid, turning your life into a country song. So, don't put your emergency fund in a certificate of deposit, because if you cash it out early, they charge a penalty. Instead, use a simple money market account with your mutual fund company, where you can easily access your funds. Some may find emergency funds boring or not sophisticated enough, but they're the most crucial key to our financial plan, guys. If you want to make one of the best investments you'll ever make in your life, listen to her. She's wired by God to be naturally smarter than you on this subject. Her nature takes her to a place of calm and security in this area. This emergency fund causes her to relax in a place you don't even have when you do the investment and the work and the budgeting to participate in the process. When this emergency fund is in place, she'll relax and look at you through a different set of eyes. This is one of two things I'm going to tell you today for those of you that are married or ever want to be married, that will revolutionize your marriage. Because she will feel completely different at that point. Not because she's weaker, because on money matters, a lot of times ladies are actually stronger, but because that's how she's wired on the subject. And she'll look at you in a different way when that emergency fund's in place. It's an investment in your marriage. An emergency fund turns a crisis into an inconvenience. If your transmission goes out and it's $2,700 to fix it, and you have $155,000, you go, Dad gum, transmission went out, that's a pain. If the transmission goes out and you were broke, you go, Oh God, the world's coming to my head. It changes your whole life. The drama starts to leave your life when you have this emergency fund stuff in place. It is absolutely powerful. That is baby step three. Now the baby steps take on a different flavor at four, five, and six. We're going to do them at the same time. So we're going to limit our investing here in 4 to only 15%, because I want to work on the other two baby steps at the same time. Instead of going 22 or 28 in savings, only 15% invested into Roth IRAs and 401ks. This is a mathematical explosion, that stuff we talked about where there's interest on the interest on the interest. Now, you've got a different kind of snowball rolling. It's rolling down the hill and you're chasing it instead of it chasing you. Now you get to see your money start to make you money. This is a plan right here. $100 a month invested from age 25 to age 65 at 12% in a decent growth stock. Mutual fund is $1,176,000. I just gave you a formula to be a millionaire. Straight up. Now 30 to 70 is the same numbers. 35 to 75 is the same numbers. $100 a month. 
That's pizza money in some of your houses. It's your cable bill. You know what I'm saying? You consume $100 in the lights. Then he's getting personal, and they're having, like, a withdrawal back there, caffeine thing happening. $100 bucks. $100. And you're a millionaire, every single month. Roth IRAs and 401ks are secret government formulas to wealth. Now, you don't have any payments but a house payment. Now, you can find $500 bucks. Let's do the numbers. Average household income is 4,175, or roughly 3K a month. That's what it is. Your take home pay is about $2,700 bucks. The average family making 40K has got a house payment of about $700. $2,700 take home minus a house payment of $700 leaves $2,000 bucks. You have $2,000 bucks to eat, pay lights. Oh, I don't have any debt payments. Maybe I could save $500 out of the $2,000. Could I? Yes. And then you might end up with some money in the process. This is real. I didn't just make this up today. We've done this for a long time, and it works. And see, here's what's interesting about those numbers. The Roth IRA grows tax-free, because it doesn't happen very often. This is Washington, and they're freaking parasites. So, tax-free is a good idea. It's very unusual. Now, Let's think about it. $6,000 a year for 40 years. What's 6K times 40? 24. That's $240,000 that went in. Is this interesting? $240,000 went in, and it grew $5.8 million. So, out of $5 million, $800,000 of it you didn't put in. Wow. It's all growth. The whole thing is growth. It's the snowball adding snow. And the fact that it's tax-free is huge because taxes on $6 million would look a lot like $1.6 million. Which means this word Roth is worth, in this example, somewhere around $400,000. Now, the 401k is a secret government formula to wealth because you do that investing pre-tax. You take $1,000 of your income and bring it home. By the time it gets home, it looks suspiciously like $700. But if you put it in pre-tax, the whole $700 plus your $300 you would have given to Congress goes in. Why is that important? Because $240,000 turns into $5.8 million. So, we want as many of these government dollars as we can gather up that would have gone to them earlier. We use them. They do a lot of heavy lifting. So every one of them is multiplied bazillions of times over. So every dollar I can keep in my hand to grow money with, with pre-tax investing, is genius. But the trick is, you need to start right now. Ben and Arthur illustrate that fact for us. Ben invests starting at age 19. He invests $2,000 a year in a good growth stock mutual fund all the way up until age 26. Ben puts in $16,000 for 8 years, $2,000 a year. That's $16,000. At age 27, he quits investing. It's not a trick question. And the money grows. And the money grows. His brother Arthur wakes up and says, Whoa, I've been dumb. I need to catch up. I'm going to start investing $2,000. He starts at age 27 and invests $2,000 a year from age 27 all the way to age 65. He puts $78,000 in, and then he never catches up. The guy who put in $16,000 beats the guy who put in $78,000 by $1,000. Some of you are going, that's a real NE chart if I was 19. You understand? If you gather this information, you put it in your brain, and it changes your heart and causes you to handle money differently for the rest of your life. This one section right here, this one chart, will make you a multi-millionaire. I just made you a millionaire if you got this. Now, let me just tell you. Some people say, am I too old to save money? Not if you're still sucking wind. Besides that, you can't go backwards. This is your only option. You can start where you are, and let's go. I'm 52. It's too late. So shoot yourself? I mean, what are you going to do? Let's go from here. We've got to go somewhere with this. I know people make the most money they've made in their lives in their 50s. Lots of people never do anything until they're 60. Colonel Sanders never fried chicken commercially until he was 67 years old. Grandma Moses never painted a painting until she was 84 years old. He did 1,500 works of art. 450 of them she did after age 100. Everything you know Winston Churchill for, he did in his 70s. Everything you know Golda Meir for, she did in her 70s. It's not over till you quit.
But with the money thing, it's easier if you start now. Now we only put 15% of our income into retirement at Baby Step 4, because I wanted to save some money to start working on the kids' college fund. If you have kids and you want to do a kids' college fund, Baby Step 5 is where you do it. You don't do the kids' college fund while you're still in debt because you don't have any money. It's all going to payments. You don't use the emergency fund to send the kids to college. That's not an emergency. And by the way, when they go to college, they could learn to do something like work. It won't kill them. College funding makes sure the kids are fit too. An educational savings account, the Education IRA, is what it's nicknamed as. The ESA is like the Roth IRA for college. It grows tax-free. You're allowed to put $2,000 a year into this account. You put $2,000 a year into it, it will grow tax-free from 0 to 18. 2 times 18 is $36,000 went in. $36,000 went in, but you'll have about $126,000 in there at 12%. When they reach 18, that means you have somewhere around $90,000 in growth that you pay no taxes on. So, do this for your kids' college, the educational savings account, and good growth stock mutual funds. Take the time to research the cost of college. You need to think about that when they're little. You need to think about that as they get older. Some of you have kids that are 13, 14 years old right now. You haven't started saving for college, and so you're not going to have enough to pay cash for college. You don't have enough to pay cash for some big expensive private school unless you put them deeply in debt. Instead, you could do something like send them to a school you can afford. Oh, there's a thought. But see, we go crazy with the word education. We worship at the altar of the diploma in this culture. And let me tell you what. Your college degree is worth nothing. The knowledge that you got on the way to getting that degree, if it is applied in the marketplace, is the only thing that has value. Knowledge is the currency of this millennium. Knowledge is important. Continual learning is important. It's not over when you leave college. You need to read and do some other things continually to get better, like you're doing in here today. Continual learning is the only way you're going to win. Teach your kids that and think about what you're getting for what you're spending. Spending. I'm happy for you if you graduated from Harvard or Yale or Princeton. I am not putting those schools down. I'm not putting down Vanderbilt. But let me tell you what, if you're going to go there, you better be ready to pay for it. And if you're telling me it's worth going $100,000 in debt to go there, I can economically prove to you you're an idiot. The average college student is graduating right now with $27,900 in student loan debt. This is crazy. And another $6,000 in credit card debt. By the way, first rule, college, pay cash. Now, we're sailing. We've got the retirement going. We've got the emergency fund in place. We're doing the kids' college into the educational savings account. Now, every other dollar above that that we get coming in, put it on the house. Pay off the house. Pay off the house. Pay off the house. Pay off the house. Think about it. What could you do if you had no payments? I mean, if you just take a house payment, put that puppy into a mutual fund every month. You know, quick, that's a million dollars really quick. You've been looking at these numbers all day long, you're beginning to see how this stuff works. I mean, what could you do if you had no payments? You'd have control of your most powerful wealth building tool, which is your income. That's the muscle of your ability to build things. Be wise, keep my home mortgage because I get the tax deduction. How many of you have ever heard the tax deduction myth? I don't want to pay off my house, I'll lose my only tax deduction. That's one of the biggest ones, and I'm amazed that CPAs are so stupid and they do this really. I've got a degree in finance. Now take a tax deduction if you have one for goodness sakes. Don't send too much money to Washington. But staying in debt because of a tax deduction, here's how that works. Think about it for a second. If you had a $100,000 mortgage at 5% interest, that means the interest that you paid that year would be 5% of $200,000 which is $10,000. Now if you do that and you make $70,000 a year, and you have a $10,000 tax deduction, and you make 70, you don't pay taxes on 70, you pay taxes on 60. If that's the case, you're in a 25% tax bracket, you save $2,500 in taxes. A tax deduction mathematically, is sending the mortgage company $10,000, to save sending taxes of $2,500 to Washington. Here's an idea. Pay off your mortgage, Give your church $10,000, and you get the exact same benefit. It's wise to borrow all I can on my home because I can invest it and make more on the investment. If I borrow money at 6.5%, and I put it in a good mutual fund making 12%, am I not making a 5.5% spread? The answer is no, 
because your little formula is naive out here in the real world where we all live. If you make 12%, you're going to pay taxes on it, and your after-tax yield is 9.4%. And out here in the real world, if you're smart, you don't compare zero-risk investments apples to apples with risky investments. I got a 30-year mortgage, and I promised to pay it like a 15. You're lying to yourself. The truth is, no one does. Something will go wrong. It will rain every month. You know the interesting thing about a 15-year mortgage? They pay off in 15 years or less every time. You know how many times a 30-year mortgage pays off in 15 years or less, unless it's refinanced? 2% of them pay off systematically in 15. Nobody does this stuff. Everybody talks about it and thinks, well, if I have a little problem, I'll have wiggle room that way. Well, your life is a little problem. That's what happens. 15-year mortgages pay off in 15 years. So here's the deal with a house. Only buy a home after baby step three. You're debt free. You have the emergency fund. I recommend paying cash. You're crazy. It's hard. I don't borrow money. There is nothing on the planet I don't have enough to go back into debt. Ever. The borrower is slave to the lender. I got that, okay? I got it all the way to the soles of my feet. I don't even want to have anything to do with a bank unless I'm buying it. That's simple. But if you're going to go get a house, never take out more than a 15-year mortgage. And never take out more than a 15-year mortgage where your payment on a fixed rate is more than a fourth of your take-home pay. You're buying too much house. And if some rip-off loan shark, subprime greedy banker is going to stick you with a prepayment penalty, an adjustable rate mortgage, an interest-only mortgage, or a balloon payment, or with an above-market interest rate just because if I get a house, my life will be good. Back off. You're not ready to buy yet. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How are we transformed? By the renewing of our minds. Transformed. Have a total money makeover. People don't get the best use of their money in half or at money problems for two basic reasons. Now, number one is ignorance. Don't get mad at me. You know I'm ignorant about some things. You don't want me doing brain surgery on you or fixing your car. In either case, there'll be parts left over. Ignorance is not a lack of intelligence. Ignorance is like know-how. I don't know how to do those things. I'm an intelligent guy, but I don't know how to do those things. You can do that. We can hire people to do brain surgery. You can hire them to work on your car, and I highly recommend it in both cases. But don't hire them to manage your money. You need to learn how to do this stuff. You can bring CPAs in to teach you. You can bring in an investment guy in the mutual funds to help you, a real estate gal over here, a good mortgage broker over here, an insurance person to teach you. But they all need to have the heart of a teacher, because all you're looking for is counsel. You're not looking for a babysitter. You're not looking for a daddy or a mommy because it's your job to manage your life. And the multitude of counselors, there's safety. You gather the information, but you make your decisions. Don't let someone else do that for you. Now we got the house paid off. Now the kids' college is underway. Now retirement's underway. See, when you get all that done, baby step seven. There's nothing left to do except build lots of wealth and give it away. You're going to have the most fun you've ever had with money when you hit baby step seven. When you launch into this area of wealth, you're going to look at things through a completely different lens that you didn't even know you had in your camera. It's a whole new way of seeing things. Your most powerful wealth building tool is your income. When you get control of that, it will launch you. And you don't have to be on the radio. You don't have to have best-selling books to do it. Regular people making $50,000, $60,000 a year do this stuff all the time. Wealth is not an escape mechanism. It is instead a tremendous responsibility. If you think your life's going to get better just because you get money, you're wrong because you become more of what you are. If you are a jerk and you get a bunch of money, you will become a very large jerk. If you're generous and charitable and you get money, you will have a huge impact on people around you. You'll never sit down in church next to a single mom who's crying because her light bill was due. But what you do is reach over and pay it to the end of the year. But you really don't do it right then. You do it after you get home so she doesn't know who did it. Because it was really God that did it. It wasn't you. You don't need to be taking the credit anyway. There's only three things you can do with money. You can have fun with it, you can invest it, and you can give it. And you need to do all three. You better be having some fun. Money's fun if you got some. You need to be investing it so you got some. And you need to be giving it because it is the most fun you'll ever have with it. Giving is possibly the most fun you'll ever have with money. That's the deal. You know Winston Churchill said, he said, 
We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Andrew Carnegie, who was the Bill Gates of his day in the year 1900, Carnegie Steel, Carnegie Hall, and started most of the public libraries in America. Today the wealthiest guy of the year 1900 used to say that surplus wealth is a sacred trust to be managed for the good of others. If you bear with me for about two minutes and not move, this last section is very very important. There's two things I want to cover with you. One is this. Each of you is perfectly trained, perfectly designed four-cylinder engines. You need to run on all four cylinders to be able to win. We're physical beings. Take care of this. You get one. Don't go to McDonald's. Eat 62 Big Macs and go. They bless this for the nourishment of our bodies. Take care of this. You got one. Eat less. Exercise more. It's not hard. Just be cognizant of what you're putting in your mouth. People don't sneak in your bedroom in the middle of the night, stuff food down your mouth. It's you. You're the one doing it. You know, I know it because I put the sign on my desk. It's the food, stupid. I know it's me. It's my job to take care of me. The second thing is we're emotional beings. If you've had something bad happen to you in your life, and most of us who are breathing have, you may need to sit down with your pastor or a good counselor and unpack your baggage. Life's too short to go through it with a Samsonite. It's heavy and scary. I came from a dysfunctional family. We all did. They have people in them. I'm not poking fun at you. I'm just saying I know what it means to hurt. And it's okay to get some help when you're hurting. It's kind of dumb not to. The third thing is this. We're intellectual beings. Feed your mind. Read, 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 read. The average person hasn't read a non-fiction book. 70% of Americans haven't read a non-fiction book since their last day of formal education. Charlie Tremendous Jones says that five years from today, you will be the same person you are today, making the same money you have today, with the same problems today, except for the books you read and the people you meet. Now, you can be an intellectual. You can feed your intellect and grow. You can take care of your body, and you can take care of your emotions. But if you do those three out of four, you are not running on 75% power until you plug in the fourth one. The other three don't work right. And when you plug it in, it takes you to more than 100% power. It takes you to zero power. It kicks in the joy. It kicks in the celebration of life. It kicks in the passion of life. It increases your creativity. It changes everything about the other three. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the spiritual. The step-by-step -step Baby Steps program is steeped in common sense biblical wisdom. It is an absolute process that is proven, literally, to date. Millions within a sea of Americans are somewhere in those baby steps. They're right now working this exact process. Millions and tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of dollars of debt, has already been paid off. Whether this stuff works is not in question. The only question that remains this evening is what you're going to do. Don't wake up five years from now and wish you changed your life. Go home this week and start. Do it right now. Say you will. Thank you, Dallas. You're awesome. While successful people are excellent communicators, so how do you communicate more effectively with others? Now the first principle is profound. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Words have the power to create or destroy, and a careless comment can alter a relationship forever. Therefore, it's essential to choose your words carefully and consider their impact before putting them out into the world. Before you speak or write, I want you to ask yourself these four questions. Is it necessary? Is it true? Is it kind? Is it helpful? If you don't get yeses to those questions, then don't say it. One observation I've made is that many people are careless with their language. The words you use either lift up your energy, make you more creative, or deny your talents. Think about the great dictators. Their words of hatred, toxicity, and breakdown cause terrifying acts. On the other hand, consider people like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., or Mother Teresa. They were careful with their words, lifting people up. Great leaders use the language of leadership. Your self-identity, income, and performance are influenced by your words. If you see yourself as average, you won't strive for greatness. Therefore, it's crucial to calibrate your language to be world-class. This leads me to the next critical skill. Effective listening. Many of us are terrible listeners, but effective communication requires both parties to focus on listening as much as speaking. An invaluable tip for important conversations. Let the other person go first. Listen to their point of view. Be curious about their feelings. And seek to understand. 
Sometimes, even when you listen closely, you may not hear exactly what the other person is trying to say. Therefore, it's essential to double-check and ensure you understood them correctly before responding. Practice speaking up when necessary, as it's a gateway to the right relationships, whether personal or professional. Teach people to be articulate, as effective communication requires knowing more than you're talking about. Read your audience. There are a thousand individuals with different engagement levels. Adjust your communication accordingly. They look confused, interested, angry, or bored, and they give you feedback about how you're doing. The people I've observed in my life who have been spectacularly successful have skills. Clearly that's a minimum precondition, but they're also very, very good at articulating themselves. So whenever they negotiate, they're successful. They are quiet, self-contained, not particularly expressive. They're sensitive, people-oriented, and concerned about other people's opinions. If you're communicating with this person, it requires a slow, low-key, easygoing, friendly, almost warm and fuzzy approach. Now the third type of person is what we call the director. They achieve with and through other people. They like to talk about achievement. What are you doing? How did you do it? How did it work? Many times they become managers or executives because they have highly integrated personalities. They're very concerned about results, but they're also concerned about people. Everybody you meet is in one of these four quadrants or groups. The mistake that most people make is that they treat everyone else as if they were just the same as they were. However, no matter which style of communicator you are, three quarters of the people you meet are something else. Now there's no right or wrong, better or worse style. These are almost born into people. You can see them in children from an early age. However, your job in asking questions and listening to people is to find out which style they are, and then to practice personality flexibility, so that you can get along with a greater number of different types of people. Somebody's having a bad day and you don't know they're having a bad day, but somebody's really feeling bad, and you offer up a kind word, maybe it's just a friendly hello, how are you? Maybe it's just taking a minute or two to listen to what somebody has to say. But your few words of kindness or your few minutes of attention could turn somebody's day around. Might make them feel more worthwhile, cared for. Be generous with your kindness. It'll go a long way. When you give kindness, it's not gone. It's invested. It'll come back to you two, five, ten, a hundred times. Kindness. It's so important in every aspect of your life. It's so important in building good relationships with others. Most people won't reveal the problem on the first question. You say, Mary, how are you today? How are things? And she says, well, everything's okay. And you can tell by the way she said it that everything's not okay. And most of us don't want to come right out and say what the real problem is unless two criteria are met. Number one, we're talking to someone we can trust. And number two, we're talking to someone who really cares. So sometimes it takes that second question, maybe a third, and maybe a fourth before trust fills and the person finally understands that you do care. Then they're willing to tell you what's really going on what's really on their mind. Learn to ask questions that will build the trust and communication between you and those you work with. Learn to express, not impress. If you want to touch somebody, express sincerity from the heart. Impressing builds a gulf. Express builds a bridge. When you want to enhance the rapport you have with someone, you need effective communication skills. You'll need the skills that'll help you work better with others to achieve their goals and achieve your goals. You need effective communication skills. Let me give you a few tips on good communication, because to be able to get along well with others, to be able to work well with others, to be able to live well with others, you must be a good communicator. Number one, have something worth saying, interest, fascination, sensitivity, and knowledge. Number two, now that you've got something worth saying, number two is say it well. You've got to be able to translate it so it'll benefit someone. You must have a good delivery system for your substance and knowledge and awareness and understanding and experience. Learn to say it well. And here are some clues on saying it well. Number one, sincerity. The best communication occurs when both people are sincere, one sincerely wishing to learn or listen, and the other sincerely wishing to share. Number two, in saying it well, is repetition. Part of saying it well is simply practicing to say it well. Practice, practice, practice. You start with something simple, and when you don't know much about what you're doing, practice is even more important. 
So practice your presentation and your ability to communicate what you know. The people out there who say no, I wouldn't care for any, are just as valuable. Why? Because they took the time to let you practice your presentation. And especially when you're just getting started, you might want to pay them to listen to you practice while you stumble around. So be thankful for the no's. Practice helps you develop skills. Skills make labor more valuable. If you just sell, you can make a living. If you skillfully sell, you can make a fortune. If you just talk, you can hold a family together. If you skillfully talk, you can build dreams in the future. The difference is skill. You can cut a tree down with a hammer, but it takes about 30 days. If you trade the hammer for an axe, you can cut the tree down in about 30 minutes. The difference between the 30 minutes and 30 days is the tool. And your best communication tool is your skill. So practice to get the skill of saying it well. Part of saying it well is sincerity. Now here's another part of saying it well, brevity. Sometimes you don't need too much, just enough. The more you know, here's what I found out. The more you know, the briefer you can be because you can learn to make words more affected. Next is style. Part of saying it well is style. Be a student of style, a variety of styles. Then make sure you develop your own. Be a student but develop your own. Don't be someone else. Let someone else influence you, but don't become them. Develop your own style. Here's another tip on saying it well. Vocabulary. You've just got to have a good vocabulary to say it well. Vocabulary. We can only translate for other people with the tools called vocabulary. If you're lacking in vocabulary, then you're lacking in tools to describe some problem or some answer. Words. Vocabulary. You can't communicate without them. And you can't communicate well without a defined vocabulary. Every time you come across a word that's new to you, what should you do? Look it up. Every time you're in a conversation, and the other person uses a word that's new to you, look it up. Now most of the time you can figure out the meaning of a new word by how it's used. But if you can't, make sure you hold your response until you know for sure. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. It gives us insight, and only with your present vocabulary can you see. You can't use tools you don't have to see. To create light, understanding, awareness, comprehension, perception, vision, you can only have as much vision as your present vocabulary will give you. And if you're limited in vocabulary, then you can't see very well. What if a person could only see the world through a little tiny hole? Now vocabulary is also what we use as a tool to express what's going on in our heart, what's going on in our head, translate our questions, translate our answers, our perceptions, what we see. To be able to say it, and I'm telling you, if you have a limited way of translating and expressing what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your head, you'll fall way behind. So you'd have twin problems without a good vocabulary. Number one, you wouldn't be able to see. Number two, you wouldn't be able to express. And your world would keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Not having the vision, not having the tools. Finally, you wouldn't need a place much bigger than 10 by 12 to live. Why? That's about as big as some people's world is. That's all they've got. This little narrow world, making mistakes every day because they can't see. Getting it wrong every day because they can't comprehend, they can't understand. No tools with which to translate. For good communication, number one is having something good to say. Number two is saying it well. And number three is reading your audience. You've got to read what's going on between you and the people you're talking to. Did you say what you're saying a little softer? Should you say it a little stronger? Should you explain it more? Should you be more clear and concise? Should you quit? A lot of the decision making that's going on during a conversation with someone depends on how well you can read, how well you can tell what's going on in the minds of those you're trying to reach. It doesn't matter if you're looking into the face of a child or the face of a colleague or a thousand faces in an audience. You've got to read what's going on. You've got to pay attention. So let me give you some ways to read. The first one is, you've got to read what you see. You've got to read what you see. Search the face of a child and see if you're coming across. See if they look perplexed. See if they're getting it. See if they can't get it. Body language tells us a lot. Look at how the people you're talking to are sitting. What they are doing with their hands, their eyes. The guy's got his arms crossed, legs crossed, chin tucked down, and frowning. You've got your work cut out for you. This guy's not going to be easy to reach. The lady's standing up from behind her desk. You've got to hurry. She's not going to listen to much more. You've probably got to pick up the pace and get down to it. So the first one is read what you see. 
Here's the second one. Read what you hear. You've got to be a good listener to be a good communicator. Get some feedback. Listen. To be a good parent, you've got to be a good listener. To talk well, you've got to listen well. That's so valuable. Get the feedback. Now what you hear may help you change gears. Be a little stronger. Be a little softer. Find a different illustration. This one isn't working. Search for another way to say it. Become sensitive to someone else's words. Not just by preparing to talk when the other person's through. Listen. Pick up those signals that the feedback of words gives us. Now here's the third way to read your audience. And that is to read how you feel. Emotional signals. You've got to learn to pick those up. Pick up those feelings. Women just seem to have this part built in. Men can learn it, but women have it. Woman says, it doesn't feel right, just doesn't feel right. Man says, what does that mean it doesn't feel right? She says, it's something, he says something, something. What is this something? She says, I'm telling you, something doesn't feel right. Now men can learn it, but women have it. Learn to read your emotion. Learn to read what others are feeling so you can adjust your communication. So you can adjust your approach. So you can get your message across. So you can communicate well. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. You've never heard of a tree grown half as high as it could. No, no, that is impossible. A tree grows as high as it can. Drives down every root it can. Produces every leaf it can. Extends itself as far as it possibly can. Every life form extends to the max, except human beings. Now why not human beings? Because we're not robots. We've been given the dignity of choice. And here are a couple of alternatives on the dignity of choice. To be part of or all of. You have the potential to be, and you've got the choice. Do a little to make yourself comfortable and forget the rest. Or do it all. Do not doubt your own ability. Don't doubt your ability to change. Don't doubt your ability to grow. Don't doubt your ability to take command. Don't doubt your ability to learn all the skills you want. I'm telling you, it's all possible. Make this note. None of us lack the capacity. We have far more capacity than we have time to take advantage of. I do read a record where it says all that time ago, some people lived to be 700 years old, 800 years old, 900 years old. I feel a little shortchanged when I only had the chance maybe to live 70, 80, 90, 100 years. When all that time ago, the record says some lived to be 700, 800, 900 years. It seems like it would take 7 or 8 or 900 years to tap the full extent of our capacity, let alone 70, 80, 90, 100 years. But here's what I'm asking you to do. Get busy. You've got more brain power than you've used so far. You've got more potential than you've used so far. You've got more strength than you've possibly used so far. No telling how many languages you can learn. No telling how far you can go. No telling how strong you can get until you get busy working on yourself and see if you can't tap all of your full potential. Success is not something you pursue. Chase, run after. Success is something you develop. Something you become. You attract success. So the whole key to unlock all the treasures, whether it's economic treasures or spiritual treasures, financial, social, personal, every way you can possibly think of, is by your own personal development. Then he added one more which is so important, and it's probably worth the price of the seminar. Here it is. What you become is much more valuable than what you get. What you become is much more valuable than what you get. The major question to ask on the job is not what am I getting here. The major question to ask on the job is what am I becoming here. Not what am I getting, what am I becoming. So it's very important what you become because what you become attracts. If you become cynical, you attract cynicism what you become attracts. So this whole subject of personal development was so vitally important to me. It changed my life. You say, well, what can I do about the upcoming winters of my life? The challenges that I know I'm going to face. Here's what you can do. You can get wiser, stronger, and better. Just make a list of that trio of words. Wiser, stronger, and better. Go home smarter than you came. Go home with more ideas than you came with. Get stronger. You can develop the muscle, you can develop the courage muscle, you can develop the inspiration muscle, you can develop the dedication muscle, you can get stronger. There isn't anybody here that can't get stronger. Next time we see you, you may not even recognize you. How strong you're going to be able to become in language, style, and personality. 
the ability to cope, the ability to handle with anything that happens, no matter what happens. And the third one is, get better. We can all get better. I've gotten better. First talk I gave, I stood up, my mind sat back down. But here's the secret to my success. I stood up and did it again. I stood up, I did it again, and I did it again, and I did it again. All those many years ago, I did it when I was scared, and I did it when I didn't want to, and I did it when I was ill, and I did it when it didn't work well, and I did it when they didn't appreciate it, and I did it a lot of times when I didn't know much of what I was doing, I just did it anyway. And now, all these years later, I'm asked to walk on this stage with the greatest introduction I've ever had, the greatest response and welcome I've ever had, the greatest opportunity I've ever had to touch this many lives with a mixture of words and heart and soul. I got better. I got better day by day and week by week and month by month. And I'm asking you to do the same thing until you can develop a long arm and a long reach. Until you can develop influence that won't quit. Touch people next year you couldn't touch this year. Touch people now you couldn't touch before. Conduct a meeting now you couldn't conduct before. Heart and soul now mixed in there that wasn't there missing before. I'm asking all of you to get better. In spite of the winters, in spite of the downturns, the money downturns, the social downturns, the personal downturns, whatever it is, just get stronger, get better. We put some of the valuable things on the high shelf, so you can't get to them until you qualify. If you want the things on the higher shelf, you've got to stand on the books you read. Every book you read, you get to stand a little higher, so you can get the things on a higher shelf. See, I learned those concepts, and it was so incredible. Do something different the next 90 days than you did the last 90 days, like picking up the books to read. Do something different, like the new health disciplines, relationship with your family, whatever it is. It doesn't matter how small it is, if you'll start doing different things with the same circumstances. Since we cannot change the circumstances, but we can change ourselves, we can change what we do. And then, he gave me another secret to success when he said, What you have at the moment, you've attracted by the person you've become. What you have at the moment, you've attracted by the person you've become. You little simple principles here, once you understand these, it starts to explain so much. Now sometimes it's a little tough to take, blaming yourself instead of the marketplace, taking responsibility instead of putting it off on someone else, that transition sometimes is a challenging mission. And this one was a little tough for me. She'll say, here's the secret, Mr. Owen. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I got that, it turned my life around. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. If you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You'd have known me. You'd have said that. I'm the guy who doesn't mind coming a little bit early, staying a little bit late. I don't mind that. You'd have said, well, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket and nothing in the bank and behind all these promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job, not on myself. I'm telling you, if you'll learn that simple little principle and start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you tonight to think and start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, make yourself more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, you can so dynamically change your income. And economics is the least of the values that you can start earning in terms of equity. If you'll start working harder on yourself than you do on your job, work hard on yourself and develop all of the stuff necessary to become more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, your whole life can explode into change. Promotions, no problem. Becoming more valuable to the company, I'm telling you, no problem. Money, no problem. Economics, no problem. Future, no problem. If you just go to work on the right thing, not get things out there to change, don't try to change the seed, don't change the soil, don't change the sunshine, don't change the rain, don't change the mix of seasons. Let the miracle of everything that's available work for you and start working on the inside. Work on your philosophy, work on your attitude, work on your personality, work on your language, work on the gift of communication, work on all of your abilities. And if you'll start making those personal changes, I'm telling you, everything will change for you. Don't doubt the future. Don't doubt the possibilities. Don't doubt the extraordinary gifts that your distributors bring to your organization. Don't doubt that. 
And here's the most important one of all. Don't doubt yourself. If I've got miracle working power to change my life, so do you. If I've got the ability to change, so do you. If I've got the ability to read, so do you. If I can discover, so can you. If I can grow, you can grow. If I can develop, you can develop. If I can get an invitation like I got six years ago to help take something around the world, so can you. If I can stand on this platform, Idaho farm boy, raising of security, so can you. If the millionaire team can do it, the president's team can do it, walk off with the diamonds, the trophies, so can you. I'm asking you, don't sell yourself short, forget the thief in the alley that's after your purse. What about the thief in your mind that's after your promise? The thief in your mind that says you're too short? The thief in your mind that says you're too tall? The thief in your mind that says, well yes, it'll happen to people out in California, but it can't happen way over here on this side of the world? I'm asking you to conquer that thief, even though you find him in your own consciousness. I want to reassure you that you can do it. I want to reassure you that you can make the decisions. I want to reassure you that no matter what the night, no matter what the storm, no matter what the difficulty, there isn't anybody here that can't figure it out, find some things to do, step at a time, yes, minute at a time, yes, day at a time, yes, week at a time, yes. But there isn't anything you can't walk away from. There isn't any challenge you can't overcome. I want you to have that kind of belief in yourself. A person who has purpose in their life, they have something to go for, some meaning. One writer described it. For some people, it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession, but it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on this. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distractions. The distractions. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger it pulls. And here's the other great advantage. If you have purpose for the future, it pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor month. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a year that goes backward. If you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties, and things that come at you, you've got to have something out there beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls, the broader, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. So that's one of the great powers that'll make a variable of you, and that is purpose. I want you to ponder these four questions. Here's the first one. And that's why. Why pay the price? Why work this hard? Why go this far? Why try to learn this much? Why try to do it all? Why try to see it all? Why try to have it all? Why do it? Why learn it? Why study? Why put yourself out? Why try to take on this much responsibility? Why develop yourself to the full? Why try to become all that you can possibly become? Why try to earn as much as you can earn? Share as much as you can share? Develop every skill you possibly can, see every human you possibly can, go to every class you possibly can, touch everybody you possibly can. Why do that much? Why go that far? Why share that much? Why give that much away? Why try to see everything? Why try to do everything? Why try to become everything? That's a good question. Why? And you're the only one personally that can answer that question for yourself. You've got to have your own list of whys. Work on your list of whys. One of the big thrusts for success is to come up with a strong enough why. If the why is powerful, the how is easy. But if the why isn't strong, if your goals aren't powerful, if the vision isn't clear, the old prophet said, without a vision, we die. Without a vision, we perish. Without a dream, we're nothing. I'm asking you to sit down with your family and develop a dream strategy. I'm asking you to make a list of what you want. What kind of health do you want? What kind of skills do you want? What kind of income do you want? What kind of gifts do you wish to bestow? 
What kind of power would you like to have? What kind of influence would you like to have? I'm asking you to go home and work on the why. Spend some time as you fly over the clouds and over the ocean back to where you came from. I'm asking you to have a vision by the time you've reached home of why you want this kind of income, why you want this kind of recognition, and these kinds of skills. I'm asking you to develop your own list of why. Now here's number two. The first question to ponder when you go home is why. Here's another good answer to why not. Why not? See how much you can earn. Why not? See how much you can learn. Why not? See how many skills you can develop. Why not? See what kind of person you can become. Why not? See what kind of influence you can have. Why not? See how many people you can rescue from oblivion. Why not? See how many people you can reach. I want you to establish some of your goals. I want you to give thoughtful consideration to your goals. And why not, if we've got good health for many? Why not the rest? If it's happened for you, why not others? And why not you? I want you to take that personal, why not? You've got to stay here till you go. I mean, what else are you going to do? Why not? See how much you can do. How far you can go. Now here's number three. Why not you? I wish I could say that to each of you individually. But it would take a couple of lifetimes to sit down and talk with each of you individually. But I would rather do that. I'd love to spend a couple of days with each of you personally and pour out my heart, my soul, what's going on in my head, what's going on with me. See if we couldn't connect and find something valuable. But time doesn't permit for us to have those intimate conversations and get to know each other that well. So, I've got to do it from up here. But I want you to take it personal. And my personal question to you is, why not you? You've got the brains, you can make decisions, you can study the plan, you can change your life, you can grow immensely in the next few years, you can make your dreams come true, you can build a financial wall around your family, nothing can get through, you can become healthy, you can become powerful. Why not you? And now here's my last question. My very last question on the questions to ponder. Why not now? This is a good time as the 20th century starts to wind down. A few more years as we get ready for Century 21. What a good time to set your goals. Work on yourself. Work on your skills. What a good time to get it together. What a good time to start this process of personal development. Growing, changing, developing, having a good plan for your money, and for your life, and for your future. Why not now? And I hope I have a chance to see you one of these days, and share with you the experience, the reaction, response you might have had from my message today. And until I get a chance to see you on this side of the world or the other side of the world, in some school or some seminar, or maybe I'll come and speak for a company that you work for someday, I hope I get a chance to meet you. Until then, I wish you the best. I want all that I've gotten to be yours and much, much more. God bless, goodbye. Everything you are or ever will be is up to you. You are the master of your own fate. The architect of your own destiny. You are self-made, completely responsible for the quality of your life and for your results. The principle of self-development is one of the vital keys to the psychology of success. Self-development requires self-discipline, hard work, and persistence. It builds character, ability, and self-esteem. The more you work on yourself, the more you like and respect and believe in yourself, the more self-confidence you have the greater the feeling of personal fulfillment you experience. Men and women who accomplish great things with their lives are not necessarily better or smarter or more gifted than others. They are usually just individuals who have made the efforts necessary to develop their potentials to a greater degree than the ordinary. The wonderful thing about our free society is that you can become just about anything you really want if you are willing to pay the price in terms of hard work on yourself. There's no limit to how far you can go except for the limits you place on yourself. I once read a quote from Abraham Lincoln that had a profound effect on my life. It was written in his diary as a young man in Springfield. It said, I will study and prepare myself and someday my chance will come. If you study and prepare yourself, your chance will come too. You will meet people unexpectedly who will enable you to utilize your knowledge. You will get phone calls and letters in the mail. You will come across articles and advertisements that lead you to use your skills and abilities. One of the most important of the mental laws is the law of correspondence, which says, as within, so without. Your outer circumstances in every area will correspond with your inner world. 
Your material financial world will reflect the quality and quantity of preparation you have engaged in. Every effort, small or large, accumulates and grows like a snowball rolling down a hill. Every act of delayed gratification, discipline and self-development counts for something. Every extraordinary accomplishment is preceded by thousands of hours of ordinary preparation. Just as a spring becomes a trickle, a trickle becomes a brook, brooks create dreams, and finally, many streams create an enormous river that flows inexorably, unstoppably, carrying everything before it to the sea. So it is with self-development. Every achievement that is recognized and applauded is preceded by countless small efforts, failures, disappointments, and setbacks that no one ever sees. You can learn whatever you need to be successful. There is more information available today to help you be more effective than has ever before existed. The smartest and most successful men and women who ever lived have poured the best of everything they know into books, tapes, seminars, and video cassettes. Some of the most valuable information on succeeding in any field is available to you in exchange for a few dollars in some hard, hard work. Would you like to double your income? How about increasing your income 10 times, a thousand percent? Would you like that? If I can show you a simple formula that is virtually guaranteed to work to double, triple, quadruple your income, would you try it? Most people will say yes, but only about 1 in 20, according to my experience, will actually do it. Here it is, a simple formula. But first, a simple question. Do you believe it is possible for you to increase your effectiveness and improve your productivity by 2% over the next month, the next 30 days? Let me put it this way. Could you do it if your life depended on it? Of course you could. One or two small changes in your daily routine, a little bit better time management, a little bit more effectiveness in your key result areas, could give you a 2% improvement. Now having done it the first month, could you do it again the second month? 2% more. How about the third month? Could you by working steadily on yourself a little bit each day, managing your time a little better, improving your overall productivity? Could you increase your performance and your effectiveness by 2% in the third month? Of course you could. Almost anyone could if they cared enough to apply themselves. You get onto a learning curve. Well, 2% per month compounded translates into 26% per year. 26% per year productivity improvement through personal development, skill enhancement, and additional training is a reasonable, believable, even modest but surely attainable goal. 26% per year compounded will equal 100 improvement in 3 years, 1000% improvement in 10 years. This simple 2% formula can be the most important success formula you ever learn. Now here's how it works. You first of all determine your aim. Do you really want to achieve great financial success in your work? Do you want it badly enough to pay the price in terms of preparation? Assuming the answer is yes, here's what you do. First of all, you stop or dramatically cut back on all those activities that do not contribute anything to your life. Then, become an avid reader. Reading is to the mind as exercise is to the body. Reading is vital to your success. Not only does it require total concentration, but you learn things by reading that you cannot learn any other way. There is no substitute for it. In fact, if you read just one book per month to develop or improve yourself in some way, it will put you in the top 1% in terms of personal development. If you read one book per week, which you can do if you read one hour per day, that will translate into 52 books per year, 5 and 20 books over 10 years. If you read 5 and 20 books to improve yourself and enhance your effectiveness at work, in a world where the average person reads less than one book per year, do you think it might give you the edge, the critical winning edge that makes all the difference between success and failure? You bet it would. One book per week would so change the course of your life in a positive way that you would be astonished. And it won't take 10 years. You will begin to see significant changes in the quality of your life and your results within months, sometimes within weeks, sometimes within days. You begin by getting up each morning two hours before your first appointment, or before you have to be at work, earlier, if necessary. Then, before you leave the house, rewrite your major goals and a brief description of your goals for the day, just a few lines. Take you a couple of minutes to rewrite those goals and impress them into your mind. This exercise activates your subconscious and gives you a sense of purpose and focus for the hours ahead. Next, and this is very important, Listen to educational audio cassettes during traveling time in your car, 
And if you use public transportation or if you're flying, the average car owner drives 12,000 to 25,000 miles per year. This is as many as 500 to 1,000 hours per year in the car. This translates into 12 and a half to 25 40 hour weeks sitting in the car behind the wheel, enjoying prime learning time. This is the equivalent of one to two university semesters. You can become one of the best educated, most highly motivated, well informed people of our society simply by listening to audio cassettes in your car. If you're not listening to audio cassettes in your car continually, you're missing hundreds of hours of prime learning time. And every hour you miss is going to cost you in lost earnings and diminished potential. The third leg of the triangle of self-development, the first two are reading and listening to audio cassettes, is courses and seminars put on by people who have achieved success in the subjects they are talking about. And this is important. Attend at least four seminars or courses per year. One every three months. Take all the training you can get and never stop learning. If your company supplies you with training opportunities, take every single one of them. And if your company does not, remember, you are totally 100 responsible for your ongoing education. The whole purpose of an education, even up to university level, is simply to teach you how to learn. From then on, it's up to you to apply the lessons. I think that the major difference between winners and losers is their attitude towards spending money on improving themselves. Winners recognize that they are their most precious asset. Winners are always investing in improving the quality of their thinking and the quality of their knowledge. They recognize that the functioning of their mind, more than anything else, is going to determine everything that happens to them. And they're always working on achieving a higher level of mental fitness and mental preparedness. Remember, they say that luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. Winners in almost every field are characterized by the fact that they know more, that they have more practical knowledge acquired through study and experience than do the underachievers. It's as simple as that. Losers always make excuses for not investing in themselves. You've probably all heard the things they say. They say things like, I can't afford it, which means of course that I won't afford it. They usually have money for clothes, and money for socializing, and money for liquor, and money for travel, but they don't have money to invest in their own minds. They say, I don't have the time, which means, of course, that they won't make the time to invest in themselves. And the worst of all, they say, I don't need that because I know all that stuff already. Most losers fall into the category of what they call the unconscious incompetent. This is the person who does not know and does not know that he does not know. The truly hopeless case. People with limited education are aware of how little they know relative to how much there is to learn so they're continually seeking new information. But university graduates often think they've learned everything there is to know, and they stop reading when they leave campus. The bottom line of the losing mentality is that the loser does not believe in himself or herself. The loser doesn't believe that any efforts in self-development would change anything, so they don't even try. Remember, a person who does not read is no better than a person who cannot read. A person who does not work on himself or herself is no better than a person who cannot. Ignorance is one of the greatest enemies of mankind, and today, in our wide-open society, ignorance is self-inflicted and inexcusable. Here are seven final thoughts on personal development. Begin right now, today, to become a perpetual learning machine. Read, study, listen to tapes, take courses continually. One hour per day of study in any subject will make you an authority in three years, a national expert in five, and an international authority in seven. Remain teachable. Remain open, interested, curious in all your life. You will never learn all there is to know about even one subject, even about yourself, for instance. If you want to be successful, study success. Become an expert on success. Learn proven success methods from others so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Get around other successful people. Fly with eagles, don't scratch with turkeys, learn from them. Ask their advice on what to do, what to read, what courses to take, what tapes to listen to, and be willing to help others with advice on success as you learn it. The human being is an organism, and if you're not growing with the input of new information and ideas, you're stagnating. Most people are stuck in a rut because they stopped growing. Don't let this happen to you. When you stop taking in new information, your mind and your brain begin to atrophy, and you tend to fall into a state of lethargy and depression. It is new information that gets you out of it. As Jim Rohn says in the audio cassette program, Seven Secrets of Wealth and Happiness, 
work at least as hard on yourself as you do on your job. The self-respect and self-confidence that come as a result of learning and growing toward the fulfillment of your potential is the root source of self-esteem and self-worth.